I think one of the questions that you probably get asked all the time is, in, say, 20 years, how do you think writers are going to be making their money, uh, assuming writers are making their money? <laughs> So I think that in 20 years, writers will be making their money differently. And that's as far as I'll go. Um, you know, we sometimes hear, especially entertainment executives, begin, a, begin their sentences with, in this period of technical transition, technological transition. And I say transition implies that it has a, a period of stability at the end of it. Like we're on some kind of S-curve where things went crazy, and we're just waiting for the plateau. Maybe they'll go crazy again later, but then there'll be another plateau at the top of it. We are not in a period of technological transition. We are in a period of permanent technological wrenching revolution. So whatever it is that works today absolutely positively will work tomorrow. It will contain the seeds of what works tomorrow, which contains the seeds of what works the next day. This is not a new thing. Um, uh, publishing is an, inher an inherently uh, technological business. The way that writers make money has changed with technology all along, from the printing press to uh, the newspapers, uh, periodical, uh, periodical uh, serials. Um, we had we had wrenching changes in the way that pulp writers made their living during World War II, when imports of American pulps were stopped, and so we had this this giant um, uh, uh, giant boom in, in uh, Canadian pulp writing. You had all these great Canadian pulp writers that came out of that. Almost all of them lost their uh, livelihoods as soon as the war was over and the embargo on American pulps ended. Uh, the rise of, um, of uh, national chains of, uh, not booksellers, but national chains of, of big box stores, which are where more than half the books sold are sold. Um, that completely changed the way that writers write because um, they bought from databases and they could tell whether or not a writer hadn't sold very well. They weren't stocked locally. Uh, all the grocery stores and so on were either driven out of the book selling business or had to buy from the same national distributors. And that's an IT story, a technology story too, because Walmart's not a company that sells cheap goods. Walmart's an IT company that uses technology to move cheap goods around. Um, and so all of this stuff is, is a technological story, and all of it changed the way that writers and publishers do business. Um, so it will be different in the future in 20 years. Um, little brother actually was Coincidentally, the first book I ever read on my iPod, so I think it was a fitting choice. Um, and the reason I say that it's not an unrelated topic is because a lot of what Little Brother is about is about the technology that we have in our lives and, and who owns it and who gets to say what use it gets put to. Uh, forgive the, the grammar of that sentence. Um, and one of the interesting things about this book is that you say that uh, it, it sprang from your head. Uh, fully formed, which is you know not something that happens very often to writers, and that you wrote it in this in this white hot theory. Obviously, it had been building for a long time. So, can you talk about the beginnings of the book, where you where that came from? Yeah, I mean, it had lots of different germs. Um, the most proximate one is is actually totally apolitical. Uh, it, I, I had seen a techno thriller film. Uh, Bruce Stern defines a techno thriller as a science fiction story with the president in it. And so, I'd seen a techno techno thriller film in which, um, as is generally the case in techno thrillers, the technology didn't work the way that it does in the real world. And this is like, um, well, it's like a Western movie in which the horses fly, right? Uh, except more so, because all the people who work on the movie and all the people who see the movie probably sit in front of a computer for every hour we've got since. And we all know that text on a screen doesn't appear in lines that go brr, 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 brr. <laughs> and we know that most people uh, outside of the, uh, the uh, small but, um, but extremely colorful world of uh, Nigerian scan letter writers use both upper and lower case when they write, uh, and so on. Uh, and, I, and I went and I saw this, and you know, of course I had my, my, my usual resentment, which is that the people who write science fiction books make so much more money than people who write science fiction novels. Um, but uh, I, I also, um, I, I came away thinking that there's a real failure of vision here. There's a real cowardice about what computers can do, because they, they, the implicit message is that computers aren't interesting enough on their own to tell a thriller. And I thought, no, you can actually tell a thriller in which the computers behave like computers. Computers are inherently exciting. Um, they weren't as inherently exciting in 1984. I think that when Bill Gibson wrote Neuromancer and used the computers in a purely allegorical fashion and had them do things that common sense recoils from, you know, if you were going to build a computer with a brain interface, presumably you put a circuit breaker in it so that you could, 
you know, fry someone's mind with the wrong software. Um, but uh, but it made sense for him to, to, to write this story because they weren't as exciting then as they are now. Today, computers are about the most exciting thing I know about. And so I set out to write a thriller in which the technology was rigorous, and I think I did it. <laughs>